Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Cloudbytes TV, where we're going to look at defining an Apex class as part of our introduction to Apex series. So, what is a class? So a class is a collection of some properties or variables and methods that form the template for some instances of that class. And those instances are called objects. When we talk about Apex being an object-oriented programming language, what we mean is that we create objects that are instances of some classes we've defined and we work with those objects. Objects are a really useful way of grouping together some states, so those are the variables and properties that we can then manipulate using our methods. A good way of thinking about objects is to think about them as things. So we might have a class that defines a dog. We can then have instances of our dog class, which would be our objects, such as Fido or Rover. Similarly, we could have a person class and have instances of our person class to get some person objects, and they could be things like Paul or Lucy or John. Account is another good example. We can have an account class from which we create account object instances. This is different to S object instances as this is an Apex class rather than the S object class. As applications grow, you're more likely to group things together by functionality rather than necessarily by specific types like this. So for example, if we had a stock API that we were working with, we might want to group together all of the related properties and variables such as authentication tokens, any state that we require to pass around, and all the methods to interact with that API client into a single class called stock API client. Another very common pattern you will see is the use of trigger handlers. So rather than having multiple triggers, you have a single trigger and a single trigger handler class, which within it has multiple methods that can be used to do the operations we need as part of our trigger execution. And so you might have a contact trigger handler class, which you create instances of when you're going away and executing your contact trigger. So let's look at an example in a diagram here. So we might have the person class that has some properties or member variables, which will be first name, last name, and age. And then we have some methods, which are walk and speak. In a future video, I'll talk through the exact difference between properties and member variables. But for the sake of this simple starting example, let's just think of them as the same thing. We then have instances created of this class, such as Lucy. Lucy has Lucy as the first name, Jones as the last name, and 27 as the age, and has the walk and speak methods. And then we have John, who is John Doe and 43. So John and Lucy are both instances of our person class. This means that we can work with these two different instances independently, yet share common functionality across them. So, for example, as we'll see in a minute, the speak method might have a standard template that we want to use in both instances. And so rather than writing it multiple times, we can create one object that does this and then multiple instances that utilize the same logic. So let's look at how we define a class. We can see here that we've defined our person class that we saw before. At the top, we have the phrase public with sharing class person. What this is going to do is it's going to define our class for us. Public is the accessor. Public means that the class can be used within our namespace or organization if we're not in a package. We can also have private classes if they are an inner class, that is one that is defined within another class or a test class. And we can also have global classes, which are ones that could be used for things such as API calls or use outside a package. We then define the class as either with or without sharing. You should almost always declare your class as with sharing. With sharing classes mean that sharing rules are applied on any queries or searches that are done across the database. This ensures that if a user is searching for some data, they only retrieve data they can see. We then finish the definition with the word class person. The keyword class says this is a class we're defining and person is the name of the class. It's a good practice to capitalize the names. 
anything within our curly braces then, those are the braces on line 1 and 14, is then part of our class definition. We have some member variables that define attributes for our class, such as first name, last name and age. Each of these member variables has an accessor, such as public, which means that it can be accessed from outside the class. So for an instance of this class, such as John, we can go John.FirstName to access John's first name property. We do this by setting it to public. We'll talk through in a later video the different accessor modifiers, but typically public and private are the two you'll deal with most. We again have a data type, just like we did for any other variable definition we're doing, and then we have the name of the member variable, which is first name. We also have some methods on this class. Here we can see we use the word public again to define how we can access the method. We use the word void here to say that we're returning no data. For the speak method below, we are returning a string instead. And we then have the method name and then any parameters we want to take in in parentheses. You can see here on the walk method that we take in a distance that we're going to use. On the speak method, we don't actually take in any parameters because we use the first name property. We can then use this first name attribute to produce a long string, hello, my name is, and then Lucy, for example, and then we return that string as we're returning a string type. This is how we define a class simply and easily for us to use. In a future video, we're going to start looking through how we create instances of these classes and working with them. I hope you found this a, a nice introduction on how to work with classes in defining them. But as we start to go through, we'll start to build out an application and see some instances of doing this in practice. Thank you very much for watching. If you found this useful, please remember to hit the like button. Remember to hit subscribe as well to get all the future videos. And if you haven't checked out some of our videos yet on things like Lightning Web Components, please just check the feed and do so. I'm sure you'll find them interesting. I look forward to seeing you on the next video.